Happy Sunday everyone, how you guys doing? Yeah, I know, I know, I'm excited of the Seahawks. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong crowd. I'm excited for Sunday service today. <laughs> uh, and I'm so honored to have met a few new students this morning. I've not met all of you. I'm, I'm sure there will be more of you uh, in, in the midst of us. But I get to meet with uh, two Williams today. I get to meet with Sharon, I get to meet with Vincent, I get to meet with Tiffany, uh, and, and all their parents. So I just want to say, welcome to the city of Seattle, guys. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I also want to extend my welcome to those of you tuning in from the YouTube channel. Uh, welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. I also want to say welcome to a dear friend that has been uh, praying for me, that has been with me for all this time. Pastor JP from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is here too. Yeah. Man, there's so much exciting thing. Amen. Um, this, uh, this week, I want to share with you um, um, a continuation of what we have been talking about. So we are still in the leadership talk. We're talking about leadership leaders because I believe that all of us here are called to be leaders, right? Some of you might be leaders in your own home. Some of you leaders to your children. Some of you are leaders in your workplace. Some of you are leaders between the marriage. Uh, some of you are uh, leaders in the care group here in the church. Some of you, like myself, as uh, leaders of an organization. But every one of us are called to be leaders. And so what I'm going to share with you today applies to everyone, okay? You, you don't tune me out because you are not yet a positional leader or you don't think that you are a leader, but all of you are leaders in some way or another. But before that, uh, I want to share with you a word of wisdom, leadership word of wisdom. Uh, you guys ready? Uh, so the first one is, oh, that's the title of my sermon, is Turning Your Violation into Victories. But this is by uh, Dwight House Eisenhower. He says, you don't lead by hitting people over the head. That's assault, not leadership. Okay, next one. Never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. <laughs> next, next one. Would I rather be feared or loved? Easy. Both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. <laughs> next one. There are three kinds of men or three kinds of people. The one that learns by reading. The few who learn by observation. And the rest of them have to pee on the electric fence for themselves. <laughs> the next one is by Dalai Lama. He says, if you think you are too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. <laughs> How many of you are from Asia, right? Uh, some of you, have, you, you understand sleeping with a mosquito. That's why I, I hate going to... To Indonesia, whenever you know you, you are trying to sleep, the mosquito starts to attack you. It's like crazy, you know. So if don't ever think of yourself too small, because each and every one of us have a, a role to play. Amen. So two weeks ago, I shared about leadership in the home. Every leaders have to start from their own home, right? Uh, because every leader's private life is a manifestation of their public uh, servanthood. Therefore, it is very important. Hey, husbands, how, how do you treat your wife? How do you serve your wife? Wives, how do you submit to your husband? How do you love and respect your husband? And then children towards the parents and parents towards the children. So this is the family dynamic that can help us in our public ministry in, in leadership. Amen? Like for myself, I always put my family first, in, in, even in my ministry. I'm sorry, guys, you are not first. I know some of you are like, oh, what kind of pastor is this? I, the church should be first. No, I'm sorry. You are not first. My wife is first. My children. And then you guys, right? Um, and it's very important. And then last week, Pastor Kismet was talking about uh, what he learned as a leader for 21 years, right? There are two things that we learned. Do you guys remember? There's a test after this, you know? Yeah, if you can answer these two questions, you might win a BMW. Ooh. <laughs> now everybody's like, oh, taking notes now, right? The key word is might. Okay. <laughs> so last week, Pastor Kismet was sharing about two things that he learned as leaders. Number one is that there are no perfect leaders. Yay. Amen. Uh, you, don't, you don't treat me as a perfect leader because I'm not, right? I'm just here to serve you and we are serving a perfect God. 
Number two is that we need to learn to be humble. We need to, be hum- we need to have humility. So today, I want to share with you another lesson that I think is very important for leaders and the lesson that, that I think most leaders need to hear and need to practice. So not only listening, but I think you need to execute it because a lot of leaders' downfall is because of this issue that I'm going to share today, okay? It's a story about two kings. It's a tale of two kings. And, and I'm going to share with you, but before that, let me read to you in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, in the Amplified Version, it says, On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, keeping yourself spiritually fit. How many of you know that sometimes we as leaders, we give, right? We give, we serve, we give, we serve. But how many of you know that we as leaders, we also need to receive. We need to be spiritually fit. We need to study. We need to let the Word of God impart into our lives. How many of you leaders, uh, maybe care group leaders or even pastors here, when you read the Bible, uh, when you become a pastor, sometimes the downfall of pastors is when you read the Bible, you always think of someone else. It always applies to someone else. It never applies to you. Like, when you read something, like, oh yeah, this is for A. This is for A. It's like, very prideful for A. Selfishness, oh, for B. But we never actually, as leaders, apply the Word of God for ourselves. And that is one of the downfall of us leaders if we have already stopped allowing the Word of God to transform our lives. Because remember, sanctification process continues, right? Our discipline continues. So, and here's what I I read. Uh, Recently, I read somewhere, I think uh, John Piper wrote this. He says, the root of all sin is pride. And the solution to pride is Humility, that's what uh, Pastor Kisman was th- talking about. So the solution to pride is humility. And the downfall of many leaders is pride. So today, I want to share with you these two different kings who approach the issues of their lives very differently. Both had fallen into their respective sins and transgression, their mistakes, but only one chose humility to repent. And we see Later on, the outcome. So I want to kind of give a subtitle. It says, The Tale of Two Kings, The Fate of Two Endings. Oh, it can be a movie here. Marvel movie. Okay. <laughs> How many of you have watched Shang-Chi? Yeah. Man, that was a good movie. I'm surprisingly, you know. But, but this is The Tale of Two Kings. The story of two endings. The fate of two endings. Number one is that it's a story of a king named Saul. Is King Saul. He reigned over Israel for 30, 42 years. And during his reign, as you guys know, he was very busy with wars. There is battles in, you know, he take over territories. He, he was having wars. So he was very busy with wars. He was trying to build military formation. And the Bible told us that he had very little time on personal faith and building relationship with God because he was busy fighting the battle, going out there and form, forming his, uh, his uh, strength, right? And Saul showed disobedience, and I'm just going to run it through very quickly so that we can all have lunch and and then watch and support our Seahawks. Uh, So two things. Uh, Saul showed, see, I'm not perfect, guys. Don't judge me, okay? Saul showed disobedience toward God publicly, at least in two instances. One is in Samuel chapter 13, where he offered up burn offering and fellowship offering on the battlefield where he was supposed to wait for the prophet Samuel to do the ritual. You know, because he was king, he thought that he was superior, he thought that he can do anything. He violated, actually, the law of God by offering the, the burn offering. Because as king at that time, he wasn't allowed to do burn offering. It was supposed to be the prophet or the chief priest that was supposed to do the burn offering. But because he was so prideful, he said, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want. I'm, I'm very powerful. So he burned the offering. So he disobeyed God. Number two, he refused to destroy the Amalek as God commanded him. That's from 1 Samuel chapter 15. So actually, Saul was given opportunities to humble himself. Uh, and to turn towards God. But he wa- and he was approached by a man of God called Prophet Samuel. Actually, Samuel came to him and, and says, Hey, King Saul, you have disobeyed God. You need to turn around because otherwise you are facing e- problems in, in the rest of your life. But King Saul refused to repent. He refused to listen to the voice of the man of God. That's going to be very dangerous if, if all of us decided that we're going to stop listening to the man of God. We're going to stop allowing the Word of God to to impact our lives. Very dangerous. 
just like King Saul, okay? Uh, he has not invested his life in the relationship with God. He kept, he kept being proud and thought that he could handle everything about life by himself. And what happened is that it led Saul into a depression. So Saul went into depression, into darkness. And the only solution to his depression to make him happier was songs, music. That's why we sing music because songs and music and praise and worship give us freedom and give us uh, 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 victories. The song that we sing today is not somebody who is performing a concert. These are people that are leading you into the presence of God by singing and praising to the Lord. So for Saul, the solution for his depression is music. So guess what? Somebody is very good at playing a very soothing music and his name is little boy David. So David came into the scene playing the harp for the, for the king and every time David plays praise and worship song to the king, the king feel good. And so David kept coming, David kept coming, and David kept becoming closer and closer to the king. And then sooner or later, David become more famous than King Saul. David more favored than King Saul. David become more popular than King Saul. And then King Saul, because he was prideful, he, he went into depression, he became very insecure. And then he shifted this part of his life, instead of being a king, instead of ruling for the sake of the people, he now is very obsessed about overthrowing this little boy named David. Just because he was more popular, just because he was more famous, just because he was more favored. And so all his life is pursuing David. And as we know, because of that obsession, because of his stubbornness and pride, he refused to turn around and he go and dig himself to the ground. He was so obsessed in killing David that he became, he lost his throne, of course, and then his son was killed in the battle and then he was killed in the battle. What a tragic ending. What a tragic legacy for King Saul. Then here we go. After Saul uh, died, uh, David was anointed to be the king of Judah. So basically the kingdom was split into two, the, uh, the Judah and then Israel. Uh, while Saul, other son, his name is Isboset, became the king of Israel, and then David became the king of Judah. So the kingdom split into two, right? And, but the king reign, uh, Isboset's reign, the Saul's other son's reign was very short. He was murdered. Again, another tragic legacy of King Saul. He was murdered and his reign was short. And after his death, David was anointed to be king over the two kingdoms. He became king over all Israel, right? King David reigned for 40 years. Now, listen guys. How many of you honestly have heard about the story of King David? Several of you, good. You know, whenever you hear the word King David or David, it's always good things, right? King David. The man after God's own heart. King David, who killed the Goliath. King David, the underdog story. Yeah. But how many of you know actually King David was also a broken man who had his own secrets and sin. David actually broke four of the ten commandments of God. He wasn't a perfect king. He wasn't what the media said about him. You know, He had his secrets too. And I want you to take to the passages here on the downfall of King David. There are a few things, but I just want to focus on this downfall of King David, which is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It says, in the spring, thank God we are not yet in the spring. We are in the fall now. <laughs> in the spring, at the time where king go off to war, David sent Joab out with the kingsmen and the whole Israel army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Okay, here's another downfall of a king, of a leader, is that when you decide to remain alone by yourself. Listen guys, this is, that's why I, I love to serve and to minister people with another, another brother, another leader. Because I don't want to be alone. I don't want to go alone, right? This is the mistakes of King David, is that when everybody go out to war, there is a battle to be won, he remain alone. 
Tell your neighbor, don't be alone. Tell to your life, to, tell to her, don't be alone. Right? That's why we have care groups. That's why we have brothers and sisters to come together. That's why we have this church community. Don't hide yourself in your room alone. Because once you make a decision to want to be alone, danger starts to happen. And this is what happened to King David. Okay? Uh, one of David's mistake was that he chose to be alone with no one accountable, especially in the time of war. He let his guts down. How many of you know Christians? Hey, brothers and sisters, we are at the time of war. How many of you realize that we are at the time of war? Right? If you don't know that we are at the time of war, just type in C N N. <laughs> right? How many of you are already confused by what's going on in the world? I am. I'm confused. Right? The expert says A, the other expert says B on one issues. And then this per person say issues number one is good. The other same person on that same issue says not good. It's a very confusing time. It's a time of war. There is a battle. There is a battle in the mind. And then verse 2. One evening... <laughs> One evening, David got up from his bed, walked around the roof again, alone. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. I know it's kind of over 18 kind of story, but it's okay. It's from the Bible. Okay. The woman was... <laughs> I was like, oh man, this is going to be very juicy here. Coming up, warning. What do you call that? <laughs> um, viewers' discretion. Listeners' discretion. discretion okay. Parents. If you don't want your little kids here the next few minutes, close their ear. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. Remember two weeks ago, I talked about the danger about the downfall of men is when they start to initiate. It's not about jumping to bed, but the initiation can cause the problem. So David initiate. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Dude, this is someone else's wife, man. And then David sent the messenger again. David made the initiation now. He said, send the messenger. And then she came to him and he slept with her. And now she was purifying herself with her monthly unclean uncleanness. Then she went back home and the woman conceived and sent word out to David saying, I am pregnant. Oops. This is bad news. Okay, not, not the pregnancy bad news, but this situation is bad news. This is someone's wife and David is initiating this relationship. Oops. This is a big oops, okay? At this point, actually David could have repented. At this point, actually, David could have humbled himself. But instead, he actually manipulated his situation. How many of you know sometimes it's like that? You know, when you tell a lie, you will hide it with another lie. And then sooner or later, you forget the first lie that you told. And then suddenly, you show inconsistency in your messaging. That's about lie. That's why I always tell the truth because the truth is always the truth. You don't have to remember about it. But once you tell a lie and then you cover the lie with another lie and that lie with another lie, sooner or later you get confused yourself. Which lie am I supposed to share? So at this point, he kept going with his secret. He tell another lie by covering it up to the point of costing the woman's husband's life. So he, he manipulated his, his, uh, his situation. He said, you know what? I think I have a good idea. What if I call Uriah back to sleep with his wife so that as if Uriah was the one who conceived the baby? Man, so smart, yeah, King David? He had this idea. But Uriah, he forgot that Uriah was a loyal man. He was very loyal to the king. And he said, oh, king, no, I can't. I'm in a battle. I can't be sleeping around with my wife. That's not right. I will be dishonoring you, king. Ouch. So Uriah didn't want to sleep. So now King David had to change strategy. Plan C, plan C. And so he said, you know what? How about this? How about send Uriah to the battlefield? Send him to the front of the line so that he for sure will get killed. To cut the long story short, 
to keep a secret of a fallen king, Uriah had to die innocently. Someone's husband had to pay the penalty for David's mistake. Pride not only is the downfall of the king, but pride is also going to dismantle other people's family. Man, he purposely sent Uriah to the front line and got him killed. David was shamelessly violated God's law. He had abused his royal power, which the Lord has actually entrusted him. Oh, how mighty have fallen. Man, I've heard even pastors, leaders, presidents, king fall. The mighty fall. Here is a man after God's own heart has been lifted from the shipfold into the palace, into prominence, into mightiness, into influence. God has been good to him. God has been faithful to him. God loves him with all his heart, but the depth of his sinfulness in the heart of not only David, but every man and woman, you and me. David lets down his guard. We can let down our guard and make some decision with awful, awful consequences. He forgot or he shunned God's law in the heart and deceived himself, thinking that it will be okay because I'm alone. Nobody knows. I'm the king. And he got caught up in the web of temptation and sexual sin and immorality. And he deceived himself without realizing that he has caused all these consequences around him. Thankfully, though, the difference between Saul and David is here. Thankfully, when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan, about his transgression in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David's response was different than Saul. David repented. David says, I have sinned against the Lord. He could have just paddle, back paddle. He could just cover it up. He could just, you know, maybe kill Nathan too. But he did not make that excuse. He come forward and said, you know what? Yes, I made a mistake. I have sinned. I want to repent. And he was forgiven. Though, of course, the consequences of his sin continue to haunt him for the rest of his life. You know, as you guys know, the story of his children and, and, and his daughter and his son. Of course, the consequences flow, but he was forgiven. He was redeemed by God. Listen, John Piper said this, Pride is a black hole of consuming selfishness at the core of fallen human nature. Pride's nature is to consume to bring into the self and it sees other people, all of creation and God himself as things to be used in service for our own benefits. Humble ourself. No matter how high you go, humble yourself. I always have to remind myself, God, please don't harden my heart that I refuse to hear your word or to refuse the advice of my leaders. Humble yourself. Just like Pastor Kismet was saying last week, that was very profound. Humble yourself. Because by the humility, God can turn things around. Right? John Maxwell, how many of you know John Maxwell? I used to take his boot camp, you know, uh, uh, his leadership boot camp. Uh, John Maxwell says this, a crisis doesn't make a person. It reveals a person. That's why in this pandemic, a lot of things happen to a person. Because when the crisis hit, it reveals the inside of us. It reveals the true us. People are confused like, oh, why is he different pre-pandemic and post-pandemic? No, he's not different. She's not different. It's the same person. It's just that the pandemic helped reveal the inside of that person. John Maxwell again says this, when there is uncertainty on the outside, a leader must have certainty on the inside. We must know whose are we. Who do we belong to? I have, I have a tweet that I, no, I don't tweet. I have an Instagram. I said, I may not know my tomorrow, but I know 
who is in my tomorrow. Right? None of us know about our tomorrow. But if you are in Christ, you know who is in your tomorrow. I want to take this time. I want to end this with a reminder to us here at the Church of God. Hey, leaders, whether you are, again, you are leaders of church, you are leaders of family, you are leaders of organization. Hey, leaders, please remember that we always need to humble ourselves. To those of you who are still growing, that's good, you are striving. But once you reach the top, what do you do with your life? What do you do with your life? You are not perfect. You know you're going to make mistakes. Nobody is going to be perfect. I made mistakes. Yesterday, on Friday, actually, when we had the Shoreline Care Group, somebody asked me, have you ever had any regrets in your leadership? I'm like, I don't remember a, an instant to tell them, but my wife reminded everyone in the care group. He said, for sure, there is regret. It's just we, we couldn't give you the example. I just cannot come up with the example. But my wife said, I'm sure he had regret. Thanks, wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have a joke again. Please don't, don't take this. You know, to those of you who doesn't know me, don't, don't judge me first. Get to know me first. This, okay. <laughs> I always tell my wife, you know, very fascinating. If you, and this is, there are some pastors here too, right? You know, whenever you hear a pastor preach, the best indicator of that person's private life is by watching his wife. Whenever you see a pastor preach up here, the best indicator of that person's private life, that pastor's private life, is by you watching the wife. That's why I never ask my wife to be here. <laughs> I send her to the other building. <laughs> Joking aside, I'm not perfect. I will make mistakes. Some mistakes are big, some mistakes are small. But that's not, the, that's not even the problem, that's not even the issue because all of us will make mistakes. The issue is how do we respond after making that mistake? That will determine our destiny. Come on, guys. Are you listening? Saul, he, he refused to listen. Prophet, uh, Prophet Simon. He refused to listen to the word of God. He refused to repent. And he was just so prideful in the end. What a tragic ending. What a tragic legacy. Every one of us, believe me, will come to a point of our lives where we make mistakes. It's how we respond to it that will set us different from other leaders. Amen? So remember this, okay? Today you might be perfect. Today you might be at the top, mountaintop. But just remember, when one day you are at the valley, how you get to the top is not by strength. How you get to the top, not by training, more training, more knowledge. You get up to the top by lowering yourself. By humility. Because God says, He despised the proud, but He lift up the humble. And I also want to remind you, very selfish. Sorry, guys. I have the mic, so I can request. I want you to also please pray for me. There's so much challenges in my life too. Right? In my family, in my lives, in my leadership, in my ministry. That's why I'm so thankful. I, I shared this with Pastor JP this morning. I said, I'm thankful for you, brother. Because you walk alongside with me and I can feel your prayer. And the SEAPC's prayer for me and for my wife, for my children. Please, pray for me. Please pray for your leaders. Please for the rest of the pastors here. You know, they gave their lives to you. Sometimes to the point of nothingness. Please pray for them too. Would you? Every morning, just take a moment. Just say, dear Jesus, dear Lord, dear Heavenly Father cover my leaders with the power of your blood. Humble themselves, Father God, so that they can always discern your word, your warning, your discipline, your correction.
Come on, guys. We need your prayer, would you? It doesn't take long. You don't have to pray for one hour. If you can say a minute to two minutes of prayer for us, it will make a lot of difference. Don't forget to pray for our wife and our children too. You know, sometimes we just pray for the pastor. We forgot that behind the pastor is the wife. The man is the head of the family. The wife is the neck of the family. Do you receive God's calling? The husband can only stare because he has to wait for the wife. The wife is the one that I will receive God's calling. The wife can make you, or the wife can break you. Should we go into this business venture? Let's invest all of our life savings in Bitcoin. That's what. Some financial people said, and then the husbands keep still, waiting for the wife, and then the wife says, "Pray for the wife too." I thank God for my wife. I shared with the Shaolin Care Group on Friday. When I was much younger, I was very aggressive. I was aggressive in my business. I was aggressive in my investment. Very aggressive. I'm like a cat. I have eight lives. If I fall, I will get up again. You know. But after I got married, I'm less aggressive, but I'm much smarter because I'm, my yes is a very calculated yes. My no. It's a very decisive no, because of my wife. Please pray for our wives, and please pray for our children. Listen, the battle has already started. The world wants our children. Are you guys listening? The world desperately wants our children. But fortunately, our children belongs to the kingdom. Come on, you know I remember Erwin. Where is Erwin? Erwin and Alau said this in the family care group. As much as we worry about our children, as much as we love our children, as much as our we want the best for our children, we always forget that God, our heavenly Father, loves them even more. Man, that always give me comfort. Sometimes I worried about my children too. I have three boys, right? Look at my white hair. I'm only 27. <laughs> Scott and Anne, <laughs> they're going to judge me. They have nine children. <laughs> But pray for our children, please. Intercede for our children. The battle has begun. And it is our moment to make sure that our children stays in the kingdom, because our heavenly Father loves them even more than we can love our children. Please pray for our city. Please pray for our church. Please pray for this nation. Let's all stand. A few years ago. Uh, there's a a new congregation that has been coming for a few weeks. I don't know if she was joking or she was being serious. He said, "Oh, pastor, how old are you?" I, uh, I share my my age, you know, my real age, and he's like, "Oh, you look older than your age." Oh, thanks. <laughs> and then she said, "Being a pastor must make people older, huh?" <laughs> She never come back to church again. <laughs> She's not here. Yeah, good for her. <laughs> so pray, 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 pray. <laughs> Let's take a moment. Let's pray. I know that every family units, every individuals have needs. Come on. 
Even though sometimes when I ask, are you okay? How are you? Really? Really? How are you? Not everybody's fine. Come on. Not everybody's fine. Not every family is fine. I don't believe it. My family is not fine all the time. Pray, pray, pray. Let's bow our head. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. So, oh, oh, the presence of God dwells in this place. His grace is bigger than any of our transgression. His blood is able to wash it white as snow again. The cross is a reminder that that work is finished not by our strength, not by our effort, but by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Today, Father God, I pray whatever that needs to be said, say it. Whatever needs to be rebuked, rebuke it. Whatever needs to be convicted, convict it. Whatever needs to be changed, change it. Whatever that needs to be trimmed, trim it. Whatever that needs to be thrown, thrown it. Whatever that needs to be separated, separate it. Whatever that needs to be humble, humble it. Whatever needs to be lifted up, lift it, Father God. Right now, the Holy Spirit is moving, moving in this room right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh yes, come on. Just receive it. Receive it. God is speaking to you. Oh yes, the Heavenly Father is loving you. Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. He is pursuing you. Even though you are running away, God is pursuing you. Even you are hiding in the valley. Valley. He is there in the valley. Even when you are celebrating in the mountaintop, God is there to celebrate with you. Come on, Jesus, come. Oh, Heavenly Father, come. Come and touch us. Come and embrace us. We need you, Lord. We need you. Oh, we are, it's not enough, Father God. It's not enough. We need more of you, Jesus. We need more of you. We need more of you. Oh, cover us with the power of your blood. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus, this morning we want to pray and intercede for our children. Oh, the world is battling for our children. They are trying to win over the hearts of our children, but I say no. For our children belongs to the Heavenly Father. For our children belongs to the Lord. For our children belong to the kingdom of heaven. We pray for our children. Oh, whether they are, they are baby or they are adult children or they are whether working children, we pray over them, Father God. Oh, cover them with the power of your blood. Do not allow the world to take over them, but the, the embrace and the love and the grace of Jesus is greater than any of the grip of the world, Father God. To those that are in depression, to those that are in depression, to those that are in darkness, in hopelessness, Father God, you serve them where they are at. You know their lives. You know their cry. You will wipe away every of their tears, Father God. You will walk alongside with them. You will listen to them. You will embrace them. You will love them. Oh, yes, Father God. We want to pray for our family, for our wife. For our wife. Oh, Father God, we know our wife sometimes in the background. But we want to pray for every of our wives because they also need you, Jesus. They need your love. They need your embrace. They need you, Father God. We want to speak blessing. We want to speak life over our wives, Father God. Yes, cover them with the power of your blood too, Jesus. Oh, allow the intimacy to be reignited in every marriages. In every marriages. If there are any brokenness, any cracks within that marriage, Father God, I pray for restoration in the name of Jesus. I pray for the spark to ignite that fire of intimacy over their marriages in the name of Jesus. Oh, right now, Father God, we want to pray. We want to pray for the father of the house. We want to pray for our husbands. Come on. Yes, Father God, they are great responsibility in the shoulder of the husbands. They have to care for their family. They have to care for the job. They have to care for the society. They have to care for so many things. Father God, we pray for your grace to be upon every father, every husband in this house, Father God. Oh, let the husband do not be proud, do not be prideful, but every husband to declare, Lord, we need you. 
we come humbly before you and we acknowledge lord that you are first and foremost the chief priest of this house you are the head of this house oh have, father god i pray right now that you will strengthen every husbands and fathers and men of the house in this in this place every man you are called to lead your family oh in the name of jesus father god thank you so much lord for for today we can celebrate this wonderful faithfulness of God in this church, in this community. We want to pray for all of the new students that are, that are just coming in, Father God. We pray for your hedge of protection as they embrace the new culture, the new uh, city, the new uh, uh, life in this place. We pray, Father God, that you will renew their mind. Their mind is not going to be influenced by the culture of this world, but their mind is going to be renewed by your word protect father god every of the students that are going back to school in person father god keep them safe keep them healthy keep them away from any diseases any sicknesses any 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 things that are not from you allow them father god to excel excel in whatever they do in their school in their lives as they continue to grow yeah. hallelujah lord jesus as we depart from here father god we bring the mercy from the throne of the Father, the love through the Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you from today till eternity, till the second coming of Christ. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday, everyone. Thank you.